Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Kia ora, Catherine. Kia ora, Jane, this time wow, from New Zealand, Zealand as we you talk. You <laughs> are looking very snuggly in your fluffy, warm jersey there. And I've got my sundress on here in mm. Japan. Indeed, being in the South Island of New Zealand from today when we're talking. So mm. it's been really lovely weather, but just today it Bit turned a little and it mm -hmm. came back to typical Christchurch weather. So I went, oh, right, this is what winter's actually like because it's been 14, 15 sunny days, beautiful. I've been quite surprised. Oh, well, but, that must uh, have I've been got nice. reality check yeah. today. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's well, been we're, very lovely. <laughs> we're having an actually a really nice day here for a change. And I thought, oh, what a lovely day, which I never think in summer. So that was nice. Long may it last. This is our last episode before summer holidays. Yay. It sure is. Actually, I can't wait to get back to summer, but <laughs> she says, I'm enjoying the famous cold. last says. words. Okay. <laughs> but yes, it's the last episode before. And I see in Japan is like so many visitors to Japan and this even in this weather, they're just dying to get there. But there mm. are 11 million people visited Japan in the first half of 2023. That's a lot of people. Mm. Great stuff. I'm thinking the tourism businesses are filling their coffers again, that which were looking pretty empty. So good for them. I know. Mm. Yeah. So good. And I think June saw the highest number of foreign visitors. I'm reading this off a website uh, with 2.7 million people traveling to Japan in wow. June. Wow. That is incredible, right? Compared to those 2020, 21, 22 figures. That's amazing. So mm. welcome back to Japan. <laughs> well, the plane was full coming down and I, mm. I think it's the same going back. So it's, it's good to see that there's a number of New Zealanders also traveling back and forth and Japanese back and forth. It's great. Mm. Excellent. Good stuff. Yes. So in this episode, we have a wonderful, wonderful guest who we think is just such a great guy and we really wanted to bring Dom to you before he flies back home to New Zealand. Tell us a little bit about Dom, Catherine. Yeah, I've known Dom since he arrived into Japan and he is the Deputy Ambassador at the New Zealand Embassy in Tokyo, Dom Walton Front. I mean, he's got such a long association with Japan and we were talking about this. We always talk about this, Jane, how you get it in your blood, you get Japan in your blood, mm. or if you're Japanese and you come down to New Zealand, I think New Zealand stays in your system as does Japan. Mm. And it did with Dom. He arrived in 1987. He came here on a, a three-week sister city exchange and then came back again and lived here for a while, did all kinds of jobs. Jobs like a typical English teacher working on a ski field, but the one that really made us laugh a lot was gas station attendant. Yes, that is such a hard job being a gas station attendant, but it sounds like they had a fantastic time. You'll have to listen to hear more about what they got up to on the in the forecourt. <laughs> it's true though, but the forecourt's a really great place to learn that whole bowing and the whole customer service and the mm. way that they do mm -hmm. that in Japan is really quite special when you go into the gas station, petrol mm. station here. Mm -mm. So yeah, so basically he's been working in public service for 25 years, internationally focused ro uh, roles, New Zealand, Asia Pacific. He was the representative on the board of the Asian Development Bank in Manila for three years. Uh, as well as Deputy High Commissioner in Tonga. So he's been around, he's been around the bazaars, as they often say in, in Kiwi English, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we loved having him in Japan for the last, I think it's six years now, but you and I wanted to sort of capture him and have him do his, this is your life. And yes. speak about his connection with Japan, what makes it a really great place to be for Kiwis doing their business here. And he gives us some really good insights on those things. And also just to have behave as an ambassador in Japan. And I don't mm. mean him and his role as ambassador, I mean all of us yes. as Kiwis. When we're in Japan, we are ambassadors for our country. We are, uh, totally. How to carry yourself, what the embassy can do for you as well. Mm. And what they can't do for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to give it a plug here because you may not get all the way through this episode, but safe travel people, sign mm. yourselves up. Dom told us that there are only 300 people registered on safe travel. And the total number of New Zealanders in Japan is anywhere between sort of 3,500 to 5,000. So that's pathetic. <laughs> 
it. And it's really, it's, it's, it's just so a, bad. It's a quick registration process. The whole point is you do it so that if something happens in this country, right, and something mm -hmm. happens in Japan, you've got a chance to be contacted by your home country people to look, be looked after, right? Yeah. yeah. And let you know what's going on in a disaster. And I think mm. after we've all been through disasters in Japan and in New Zealand, it's something we really need to have fun, yeah. front of mind. You just do it and then there. it's done. Right, yeah, do it and then it's be done. On there. Yes, just get on there. It's not a big deal. And, you know, you might be all, but I don't want them to know where I am. Like, honestly, this is really worth your time. It's really worth getting you and your family on there. They will contact you. I have been contacted by the embassy. They really tried their hardest to help me mm -hmm. in 2011 when I was here in Fukushima. And all through COVID as well, I got all sorts of uh, information when I was in Sweden at that time, where I could go and couldn't go, how I could get back to New Zealand or not from being registered on Safe Travel. So that's our little plug for Safe Travel yeah. on the front end. You'll hear another one on the other end as well. But we look forward to um, bringing you this one and also just go back and listen to some of the other ones over the summertime, right? Mm. We're off uh, from after you hear this through mm. to September 11, we come back on to the airwaves. So just get back and listen to some of the ones that you haven't listened to before. Share with somebody who you think might be really interested in listening to our stories. We love it. As I've just said before, I'm currently in New Zealand and there's a few people here who have been very interested in the name Jandals in Japan. They love it. Oh, nice. And they're regulars who want to just sign up and listen. And they're very curious about the fact that there's some podcast in Japan about Kiwis doing business. So spread the word for us. That's the only favor we might ask to do. Mm -hmm. Let anybody know about it because it's actually broader than what you think, the popularity or the curiosity about it. Yeah, it's good um, fun too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Any episodes on the break? Any, any episodes, episodes that you think, oh, this is a must listen because well, well, two people this week literally said to me that they'd listened to the episode of Cookie Time with Jason Allen and they oh, loved it. They loved it. And you know what? I actually met Jason Allen's like uncle. Oh, funny. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a meeting I was in, he was there and I was like, what? Uh, one degree of separation in this tiny town. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, he had listened to it and then there was another person who had no relation to Jason who had listened to the episode as well and thought how remarkable it was that you can go to the extent that he's done and got into, you know, stores in Japan mm -hmm. to sell New Zealand product, get the SKUs alongside all those other famous mm -hmm. Japanese brands mm -hmm. in the we convenience need to get store. Jason That's back. massive. Let's get him back. We do need to get him back because since then things have been going so great for cookie time. Have a yeah. hand, right? So we need exactly. to hear more about that, I think. Jason, we're coming for you again. Coming for you. And the other episode <laughs> would be Makoto Kinjo's episode. Mm -hmm. I was at a, a restaurant here in Christchurch called Kinji's and Kinji-san, mm -hmm. of course, knows Makoto Kinjo. Mm -hmm. He said that they'd heard about this episode with him and they, they listened in. And that's also a really great episode to go into as well because of his devotion, long term devotion mm -hmm. to New Zealand and Japan so those would be two that I'd pick out immediately how about you Jane anything there yeah one that just keeps coming back to me is Rebecca Thorne's episode mm -hmm. about you know hospitality yep. and a learning journey in Japan and bringing this new ha hotel yeah. to life in Shibuya which opens fairly soon very exciting and just you know how amazing she is and how lucky we ha are to have her in our community here in Japan as well. So that would be my top recommendation. Yeah, but yeah, Makoto Kinjo is seven or something. So seven and like three or four of Jason. Four yeah, so you've got to go yes. scroll right down to get to those two. They're kind of at the very start of our journey. It'll be interesting to listen back to some of our earlier work. <laughs> we can't forget Dave, right? David Mayer from Scalar Up. And he is also, I think, episode 10. Oh, okay. He reminded me recently he was episode 10. And so he's also great <laughs> he because he's he knows and he's talking about Kaizen. So it's a little different. Why have we got the CEO of Scalar Up on our episode? But you can mm. listen and find out. But he's a real advocate for Kaizen. And you right. can hear all about that Another from her famous food. Japanese yeah. term, Kaizen. Yeah. Yes, yeah. learn all about that. All right. Well, there's some summer listening for you. We will put the links to those episodes in the show notes so you can find them quickly and click on through. And we'll see you on the other side, but please enjoy this episode with Dom. Kia ora, Dom. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Great to have you on the show. Kia ora. Thanks for having me. We like to start off with a bit of a warm-up question. So today, we know you're about to leave Japan to return to New Zealand. 
What's the first thing you will do when you get to Wellington? Ah, good question. Well, probably I'll see if I can head out and catch up with my kids actually, because uh, they've been they're living in New Zealand at the moment. I've got uh, older kids who are at university, and we'll probably go to our favourite cafe and uh, yeah, have a coffee. Good New Zealand flat white. Nice. Catch up, catch up with family will be the first thing I do when I get back. For yeah. Sure. And what's your favourite cafe? Just, you know, for future reference, the next time I find myself in good old Wellington. So our favourite family cafe, we, last time we were in Wellington, we lived in Petone and the sort of surf club or the uh, the rowing club down on the waterfront there mm. um, has this really great cafe. It's sort of a retro style with old pinball machines and that sort oh, of thing. Nice. So, yeah. Great coffee and burgers and that sort of stuff and a view of, a view of the sea. So yeah, that would be very, very good place to yeah. catch up with family. Awesome. Yeah. Catherine, you're heading back to New Zealand soon. What are you going to do first? Get off the plane and what are you going to do? Oh, I might have to have a hot cocoa because it's going to be winter and I'm coming from Japan, which is mm. hot 35 degrees today. Ooh. Ooh. But I actually might try and find something really quintessential New Zealand, like fish and chips. I'm going to have some fish and chips this time. Probably ages and ages since I've had fish and chips. So I mm. feel that's what's coming up for me right now. More Yum than I. a hot cocoa. Fish and chips mm. it is. That would be my first dinner back too, I think. If I, really? if I was going back, it would be some fish and chips. Some good old fish and chips. Awesome. Well, Dom, we're so happy to have you. We've snapped you up before you leave Japan and go back to New Zealand. Also, we're going to be putting your full bio into the show notes. Tell us a little bit, though, about your background uh, growing up in New Zealand and then what brought you to Japan for the first time. Sure. Well, thanks again for having me. It's really great to be here. So born in Dunedin, down in the deep south, and grew up there, went to you know high school there, university and everything like that. So sort of really Dunedin boy. But then when I graduated university, went up to Wellington, got a job. Well, there was a little bit of in the middle sort of traveled the world for about four years, but came back, then uh, got a job in Wellington. So Wellington sort of has become home for me now. But yeah, back to my first Japan experience, that goes a long way back, back to 1987. It's just making me sound a little bit old. But uh, in my defense, I was only 13 years old at the, at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, I was a high school student, first year high school, living in Dunedin, and there was this ad in the, the local sort of midweek newspaper that said, if you want to go to Japan, write an essay. And I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at writing essays. And I was like, <laughs> sort of shouted out to mom, can I write an essay about going, why I should go to Japan? She's like, yes, dear. So like, she didn't think yes, dear. Leave me alone. Please do it by yourself. <laughs> didn't, didn't realize <laughs> something was going to come of it. And um, yeah, I got selected to go on the, in this group of young people to, to Japan. And it was a sister city exchange. And Dunedin's sister city in Japan is Otaru which is up in Hokkaido, mm. sort of small port city, about the same size as Dunedin. And it just, it was an amazing experience because I'd never left New Zealand before. Went to Japan, it was this completely different culture. I got put into a homestay for a few days, you know, where they, no one spoke the, the language, had to look up a dictionary, try and explain something. And um, we went to this international camp where they brought in kids in from all around the world. And um, we went down to Tokyo Disneyland. We, oh my goodness. You know, there's all these what amazing things in Japan. And one of my probably enduring memories was grape Fanta, you know, when you're 13 Ooh. and you think that the only flavor of Fanta was orange Fanta. And then you see, oh my, mind <laughs> blowing. There's, like, there's actually three different kinds of Fanta. And I was like, wow, I could go back and tell my friends about this. I had the same experience to the old grape Fanta. It was quite oh, a nice. remarkable one, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a real eye opener. I mean, in more ways than one, right. And so I came back and then just by good fortune, my high school in Dunedin at the time offered Japanese. So I, joined the Japanese class along with about kind of eight or 10 of my mates. And the funny thing is there are now eight of us from my high school living in Japan. No, um, really? Yeah. And the, most of them have been here 25, 30 years. Oh, um, in oh, fact, wow. I'm the only one who's not married to a Japanese woman. So those guys are all embedded in their community, mm, running different businesses. Wow. And, sort of and, and in fact, seven out of eight of us were at the rugby game at Chichibu Nomiya Stadium on Saturday, two days ago. Yeah, we got them all together for the sort of last that's hurrah, say goodbye. Cool. So, so that's a bit of a unique sort of thing. So I guess, you know, summing up, this short exchange had this huge impact on my life and, and others' lives around me, like my mm. um, the next generation. I've been bringing my kids back to Japan, partly as a result of me coming to Japan. My brother came to Japan and he ended up marrying a Japanese woman, has four kids, and um, 
you know, and so I really wanted to, to today to give a shout out to all the people who have been over the years working on these sister city relationships and yes. They probably don't realize sometimes the impact that just like this short little three week exchange could have on people's lives. But it really does um, sort of open my eyes to the world and changed changed my life. And as you know, Catherine, um, uh, forty sister city relationships between New Zealand and Japan, and mm. the oldest one is Kurashiki in Christchurch. Mm. And um, Dunedin Otago is over forty over forty years old. That relationship, mm. some really hardworking people who have been you know, putting in time over the last 30, 40 years to just building relationships. And most of them are all volunteers, volunteering their time just to promote kind of good relationships between the two cities. And and maybe they don't always realise how much of an impact they've had on people's lives. Absolutely chills. big impact. Oh yeah, my gosh. very big chills. I mean, Christchurch Kuraski, it's just been formative for me. You know, mm. the opportunities I had to um, look after the mayor when he visited here or, mm. Mm. Um, you know, when I was based in Japan and the group came through, for, I think, for the 40th or the 30th anniversary, yep. just all those sorts of things that it brings to you. It really enriches your life. And I love how you mentioned about how Japanese language, once it's in your system, mm. it just it designs almost the rest of your life for you, doesn't it? If you either love it or you don't. And once That's you've right. got it, you cannot get rid of it. It's going to just yeah. infiltrate you. <laughs> Right, yeah. be yeah. very informative to everything you do after that. Yeah, yeah. My Japanese language study, I kind of my so far it's been my thirty-five year journey, and <laughs> um, <laughs> I have my kanji poster on the wall, and kind of I I go sometimes I'll have a bit of focus and I make some progress, and then slip backwards again. And <laughs> it's definitely a lifetime journey to try to for me to try yeah. and learn Japanese. Now you missed a little story there, didn't you, about a certain female that you met while you were in Japan. Oh yes, okay. So well, after I after all that happened, and we went to high school and you know st- studied Japanese and all this stuff, I couldn't wait to get back to Japan. So um, I was studying Japanese in my first year at university, doing it by correspondence through Massey, and um, we went up for this on-campus course in about August. And our lecturer said, "Oh look, you guys are never going to learn Japanese, just you know, sitting there or filling out some booklets." And we go, "We know, and so <laughs> we know, we lecturer, have to go there." You know, Alexa, a great guy. He said, "Look, if you want to go to Japan for the for the summer, I'll organise your homestay and a job." And um, we're like, "Great! How do I sign up?" So he's like, "Okay, I'll, I'll organise it all for you." So we're like, "All right, this is great." And you've heard about this. I won't go into any details, but you've heard about it on a previous podcast when you interviewed Mike Harris. Um, yeah. So Mike Harris and I ended up working in a gas station in a small rural town in Shizuoka, and we were oh, but- a bit of a bit of a novelty. We, um, you know, amongst oh, the only my foreigners goodness, in must town, have been. and there was. People. You two together. Yeah, yeah. To get in. petrol must have been epic. Well, I'm coming yeah. to ogle at you. It's a very quiet <laughs> gas station. But some people we'd have these regulars would come in every day and fill up with 100 yen of gas just to sort of have a chat to the chat. Oh, the no way. I yeah, love seriously. it. We had our regulars and um, the guys at the gas station, you know, we were young 19-year-old rugby players, sort of fairly burly fellows and um, – they used to, when the, the truck drivers came in, they'd challenge us to an arm wrestle and we'd sort of arm wrestle. <laughs> if they could beat me, then they'd get a chance to wrestle Mike, which was <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, there was, there, was, there was one other um, Kiwi in the town uh, at the time who came along and uh, yeah, they, I ended up kind of asking her out and uh, she's now my wife today. So we've, that was what? it. Uh, yeah, no that was way. 1992, so ooh, 31 years ago. So we were... three Kiwis in town, the two guys are pulling the gas, and this other Kiwi woman who, where did she work? Well, she was working at Mr. Donuts, so it's kind of a funny story. Her, her, um, <laughs> her flatmate was also doing this kind of, we didn't know her, but she was doing this on the sort of uh, Kiwaku, the, the, the correspondence study, yeah, yeah. And so she was supposed to go on this trip with us, and... Um, <gasps> She pulled out the last minute and sort of said to her flatmates, oh, anyone want to go to Japan next week? <laughs> and my wife Hannah said, oh, yeah, I can go. I, was, <gasps> I can say konnichiwa. And uh, so she turned up and um, she met, met us. <gasps> no and, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. Sliding doors the, moment. Oh, my God. I know. It really was. It really was. So that, you know, certainly this whole, as I say, kind of it's... this little drop, I guess, and the ripples that spread out mm-hmm. after that have sort of 
changed yeah definitely like, i mean you could have just hung around for a while but you actually got married and there's that whole journey and she's been with you too and with your children for those last these last four years here and there back between new zealand and japan yeah well, that's right we wow. came, um, came to japan for four years in the mid 90s and we were doing various things like working on ski fields and um i was rafting and we we're both teaching english and that sort of thing so we had a really great time sort of um and we actually got married when we didn't get married in japan but while we were in japan we got married as well so you know, we have a lot of fond memories of Japan and um, we brought our kids back here multiple times and, uh, you know, and in actual fact, just to sort of, you know, complete the cycle, my son ended up uh, working for Mike as a ski instructor. Um, so Yay! it's like the next the next generation, you know, uh, Mike's son guiding us in a boat down the river instead of me guiding people in a boat down the river. Yeah. Isn't so, that magical? It. Yeah. Love so, it. Oh. Yeah. And, and in actual fact, we um, I had the, the good fortune about two weeks ago to go back to Otaru. And it was the first time I'd been back. So my brother ended up studying at Otaru University in 1995 for a year. And he was on one of these sister city exchanges, again, the sister city connections. Right. And wow. so when I went back two weeks ago, it was like Niju Hachinen Buri. So 28 years since I'd been <gasps> back. 28 mm. years. Yeah. And it was 35 years since the original sort of visit. So they. Wow. Um, and it was such a nice moment because um, it was the Otaru New Zealand Friendship Society was having their annual meeting and they wanted someone from the embassy to come and say a few words. So I was like, well, let me tell you, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> story. I'm just about to to leave, but it's going to come full cycle. And, um, yes. and the really nice thing was um, there was a chance for us to recognize Saijo-san, who's the president of that Friendship Society. Mm -hmm. And he's been working on the Japan Otaru Dunedin relationship for 40 years at least, I'd say. And um, he was given just recently in the last, um, in June, a New Zealand Order of Merit for his efforts. Oh, nice. And so I was able to go up there and congratulate him. And it was sort Fantastic. of recognition of, you know, all of the effort he's put in. So, mm. yeah, I think um, that, that, was, that was a really nice moment, just sort of <laughs> yeah, on, my just, way, on my way out, going back like to. You couldn't even like, map this out no. in a. I know, oh, crazy, right? Right. I actually feel like it could be a movie. <laughs> yeah Good well when i applied for this job in japan i've almost had to say yeah uh, i feel like this is kind of i didn't quite say it but this is like my destiny to go back to japan mm. um it's sort Absolutely. of my life has just been intertwined with japan so it was a real dream job to come back and be here working at the embassy representing new zealand yeah. um trying yeah. to build stronger relationships between new zealand and japan i mean that's kind of what i've been doing for the last four years so another story just about the sort of cycle of life and how um i don't know it's maybe it's destiny or whatever but this goes back to the 2019 rugby world cup and um when you have the rugby world cup you don't just have the rugby world cup there's the parliamentary rugby world cup where the parliamentary teams play and then there's um there's actually a an army or a uh, sort of a military rugby world cup as well and 100 years earlier 2019 one of my ancestors one of my great great uncles was actually the captain of the new zealand wow. army team so they were all hanging around in europe after world war one 1919 uh, you're talking 1919, about 1919 yeah wow yep, yep, yep. yeah and they had this um kind of was kind of like a precursor to the rugby world cup and it was the first sort of army or military yeah. rugby world cup and new zealand was the winners and i've got this photo on our wall of the ancestors <laughs> in, in my living room of my great great uncle receiving a cup from king george um and, and it, you know, fast forward 100 years, 2019, there I am at the um, the Army Rugby World Cup in Japan. And I'm uh, oh, just thinking, you know, goodness. how amazing it was. And, and I was it there was for amazing. The, um, you know, the final ceremony where they're handing over the cup and that sort of thing. And it wasn't, unfortunately, to the New Zealand team, but it was great. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, it was that was pretty amazing. Just and again, it sort of had that feeling of it was slightly surreal feeling of um, mm. how history kind of comes around and, you know, like. Me being in Otaru back in 80, 1987 and then back again 35 years later. And um, yeah, how life comes around and um, and how it was just this amazing experience to be back in Japan and, and having all these connections. So mm. Fantastic. A, yeah, what a privilege. Talking about that, yeah? yeah, I mean, your role and what does it entail? And tell us a bit more too about the broader, wider embassy's role in Japan here. So um, role of the embassy is quite huge, actually. <laughs> I thought about how to explain this, and, and the analogy I like to use is that it's like, um, let's see, the relationship between New Zealand and Japan, if I think of it like a pyramid, um, the, the base of the pyramid is kind of like probably our trade, trade in goods and services particularly. So Japan is our fourth largest export market, and we probably two-way trade is about $10 billion. 
So there's a lot of New Zealand and Japanese goods coming back and forth. I mean, most of the stuff probably coming out from New Zealand will be dairy, fruit and aluminium, um, meat and wine and all that sort of stuff. Good, good Kiwi stuff. On the other way back down, it's sort of used cars and fuel and some technology exports and that sort of thing. So it's very complementary sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So lots of Japanese consumer or people that their interaction with New Zealand might be eating a, a kiwi fruit or mm -hmm. um, you know sampling some New Zealand wine or manuka honey or something like that. And then then you've got the the sort of next level up, which is people who travel back and forth. So mm -hmm. all of this, this sort of a hundred thousand odd tourists that go back and forth every year, uh, each in each direction, and and then the the students like like me, like all those years ago, there are ten thousand Japanese students every year go down to New Zealand and form those lasting memories and build these sort of ongoing relationships. And then we've got our sister city societies, our friendship societies. Mm. We've got a whole bunch of Japanese companies that are investing in New Zealand, um, mm. and it's about five billion dollars worth of Japanese kind of investment down in New Zealand. And so the embassy let's say, operate just at the top top part of the pyramid in the government-to-government -government connections. And um, the real peak of that would be when our prime ministers meet. It's at a symbolic meeting of our two countries. And at the embassy, we sort of organise those things. But every level of the pyramid, we're trying to promote and strengthen those sort of layers. So mm -hmm. we've got New Zealand Trade and Enterprise has about a six or eight person team here. And they are trying to promote that two-way trade between New Zealand and Japan by helping New Zealand businesses into the market. And we've got Tourism NZ have three or four people in an office here who are sort of telling Japanese people, get down to New Zealand, it's a great place to visit. And Education New Zealand has an office here in the embassy and they they promote this whole thing of exchanges. And NZTE has an investment person who's specifically looking to get Japanese investors down to New Zealand. And we have kind of someone from Defence um, working on collaborating with the Japanese Self-Defence Forces. We've got someone from Customs, MPI, uh, that's our Ministry of Primary Industries, uh, promoting that kind of agricultural trade and mm. yeah so we've got like a big team and and we're really all about strengthening and looking for those areas of cooperation and how to deepen this mutually beneficial relationship between New Zealand and Japan so that's it's that's kind of a bit of a nutshell I guess of the role of the embassy and I'm the the number two at the embassy um, so the ambassador is the important person who goes out and meets everybody and I, I try to help keep everything running basically. The pyramid is an absolutely wonderful way mm. to describe it in that you are the promoter of each of those layers and you've just described that so well. I hope the embassy takes this up as their <laughs> next little brochure or something. That's really, really great way of actually explaining all the components, how they fit in. Because we sometimes think, how does what's New Zealand tourism doing there and where's NZTE fit in? But mm. you've just explained it so, so well. It's really, really useful. Yeah, so the great thing is that all this stuff is going on every day without the embassy kind of having to do it all right we're not, we're not mm. doing it all we're just trying to help promote some bits and we're responsible mm. for the the top the top part which is the the sort of formal government to government relationships but um you know mm. that just amazes me every day i hear these sort of amazing things like i've forgotten his name now but you yeah, we were talking about the kurashki sister city um it's celebrating their 50th anniversary this year their relationship with kurashki and Krushich. and um one of the guys from Krushich who's a real supporter of of that relationship sailed a yacht up to uh, from New Zealand to Japan to mark the occasion and then went and spoke at a local high school. And, um, you know, that's just an amazing sort of individual who's doing doing something to promote those relationships. And and I'm sure that was a really memorable time for those students who heard him mm. speak at the high school. And so there's all this sort of connections and, and interactions mm. going on every day in this sort of vast web of connections that we try to promote and strengthen those connections but um but it's all happening and so it's it's just great it's really heartwarming actually that's great yeah we've as we've been doing this podcast now for a year and a half we have started to uncover some of these hidden stories and connections it's been really fantastic to bring them into the light to appreciate more what is going on in the background mm. and you mentioned uh before we hit record about some of your other postings in the world that you had before you came to japan but what has being in Japan taught you about New Zealand, about people, what we can do more of going forward? That's a big, big question. <laughs> I guess I would probably start with um, talking about, you know, diplomacy. I guess that's my my core role here. Um, diplomacy is very much a sort of a people to people um, activity. And, and as you know, I've been here just over four years and about 
two or three years of that time has been has the whole the COVID shadow hanging over it all. So in a way, I think COVID has kind of really brought that into sharp relief, I guess, the fact that the importance of those people to people links. So with COVID, we of course went online and we did lots of Zooming and uh, in 2021, New Zealand hosted um, APEC completely online, all of the ministerial meetings and all that sort of thing. And so it was quite a, a heroic effort and we got we still had good engagement and we, we got things done. But what we realized, of course, is you can have the formal meeting, but after the meeting, it's all of the informal interactions that take place. We've learned some new tools, I guess. So one of the useful tools is you don't always have to get on a plane and go to a meeting. You can actually have someone dial in, dial into a meeting. But there's no substitute in a way for the for the actual in-person meeting. So maybe give you a couple of examples um, that might illustrate it. We had, during COVID, our trade kept on going pretty well, actually. In fact, um, more people in Japan were interested in New Zealand goods than before, partly because of this sort of sustainability and clean and green. And people thought, you know, eating a kiwi fruit, that'll be nice and healthy. And um, so New Zealand had this good image. And, and But we, we we really wanted to see what we could do to sort of help promote our trade. And uh, we had this sort of virtual trade delegation. And our great staff from NZTE who work in the embassy they would get their kind of New Zealand business people who couldn't travel to Japan, work out who are your clients. And they would say, well, we'll go and do your your business meeting with you, you know, bring you along to the meeting. And so they sort of did these um, virtual visits and they actually helped people to uh, to have these meetings online and that sort of thing. And so there was an in-person component and a, like a hybrid sort of thing. Hmm. But once we once the borders were open again, I mean, Catherine, you were there. There was um, the first Japan New Zealand Business Council meeting last year in um, in Oita. And oh, yes, sorry, Jane Beth, was there too. We both yeah, right, okay. popped um, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was like the, this huge comeback, like fifty New Zealand businesses coming <laughs> up, and everyone was just kind of hungry to reconnect again and um, yes. and the in person sort of things. And an example of that that for us was last year around about the same time, New Zealand's energy energy minister came up to Japan with a business delegation. And we really saw the, the whole value again of um, you know, getting in the room together. And when you have a minister there, it opens up doors. So there are this sort of Japanese renewable energy companies. We go, oh, we've got a minister coming. You've got a minister coming. We better bring the, the shacho. Mm. And mm. so there was a sort of halo effect with our business people mm. who, um, who were sort of sitting around with the minister and then exchanging the business cards. And then afterwards, they had their sort of side working meetings, but they had this extra credibility and and that actually led to some kind of concrete business deals out of that visit. So we we were really, I think, reminded of that, that kind of usefulness of the people to people connections and the way we work with people and and find common, you know, perspectives and common touch points that we can we can build off. So that that was a, maybe one of the key things mm-hmm. I wanted to highlight, I guess, around sort of things that I've learned here in Japan. Amazing. And how about for yourself, you yourself as a leader, keeping on that people point, how's it helped you develop you, Dom? Because I've seen the difference in you over the years, to be honest. Amazing, like how you've grasped Japan and you've actually been a leader amongst the community, joining the ANZCCJ meetings, the Australian New Zealand Chamber meetings. You've been a really great person for me to confide in and discuss things with. So how about you then from your side? That's enough compliments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, what's Japan taught you about yourself as a leader? Well, thanks. That's, thanks for those kind words. That's very nice of you. I mean, you're a real leader yourself in the New Zealand community. Thank you. On the topic of leadership, I wanted to share one Fakatoki actually, a Māori saying, He aha te mea nui o te ao. What is the most important thing in the world? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It's the people, it is the people, it is the people. And that just like during COVID, that was so reinforced for me because, you know, you're only as good as your your team. And we often get quite focused on what's the most important thing I've got to do today as a, let's say it's a meeting or a report I've got to write. But actually, it's it's the people. And and if somebody rang up and said, oh, I've, I've got COVID, suddenly you've got to drop everything and go, right, okay, um, that me- that report I was about to write isn't important. What's actually important is people's well-being and, and looking after our people. So we spend a lot of time working out, you know, what is this new virus and how do we, um, how do we keep ourselves safe, but also still be effective. And yeah, I think the 
the well-being also took on a broader dimension. So, you know, I think we talked about before, bring your whole self to work and that sort of thing, but we were probably, if we're being honest, more just super interested in how many reports you could write and, you know, how much you could do and output and whatever. What I've really learned through COVID is the importance of all of the other things outside of work. Like um, we we organized things like um, yoga classes and we made sure people didn't get isolated, so that we had connection to community. We focus on work-life balance more than we had before so that people could bring their best selves to work. And, and the whole flexibility, the whole flexible working thing has meant that we've got, you know, different ways of working. So, um, yeah, your productivity depends on how happy and productive your your people are. And um, for me, it's been how do you bring the best out in people? So that's that's been my key key learning, I think, from from the pandemic. So have you had any unforgettable moments in this position being a diplomat in the Tokyo embassy in your four years here? I've had many unforgettable moments. <laughs> <laughs> Rugby World Cup was such a highlight. You know, I got to meet some of my real heroes. So I had um, Buck Shelford, for example, coming to watch the rugby at the embassy, you know. Um, oh, cool. Had a beer with Steve Hansen. Um, yeah. You know, nice. I was in a TV commercial with Richie McCaw. <laughs> Oh, you yeah. were? Oh, were you in that AIG one, were yes. you? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, you know, Fun. how often do you get a chance yeah. to do these sort of things? Yeah. So, that, you know, some really incredible things. But the mm. thing, probably the, the thing that stands out for me the most was right at the beginning of my posting, our ambassador had to go and present his credentials to the head of state before he can start operating. And so we got a chance as a team to go along and meet the emperor of Japan. No and way. It, it's just like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because, you know, you you go to Tokyo and you walk around the outside of the palace and you go, wow, this is like this huge fortress. And there's little bits mm. you can kind of duck into, but you really can't go inside the palace. But we got to go inside the palace and meet the emperor. And it's quite a, it's a big deal, right? The emperor it is a big in, deal. Yeah, very high regard. He's really a symbol of Japan. And um, mm. so the the people from the palace office came around and they were like, well, you can't just rock up and see the, the emperor. <laughs> there's, a, there's a way of doing things. This is not Kiwi casual. So <laughs> no jandals. No jandals, no. And we had to have um, bowing practice. Um, oh, yep. what's and the, the person, protocol? Well, so the, the person from the palace office came in and said, okay, the first thing you do when you enter the room is a shallow bow. And the guy bowed down to his head was nearly at his, like touching his shins. We were like, that's a shallow <laughs> bow. I don't think my hamstrings can kind of uh, quite do justice to, to that. But basically you, you, you bow when you enter the room, you walk, approach the emperor. When you get a bit, Closer, you you bow again, and then you kind of walk walk up, shake hands. Then you walk backwards without turning your back on the emperor, bow again, and then walk backwards a little bit. And then before you exit the room, you bow again. So we really wanted to show the sort of proper respect for the emperor. And um, the ambassador himself actually ended up having, he was able to have a bit of a chat with the emperor. The rest of us were mm. uh, just <laughs> kind of go, like went in through. awe, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know, I know. So it's pretty amazing, right? So, the, yes. I mean, this is one of the cool, cool things of a job is we do get to meet some amazing people and, um, you know, have some amazing experiences. And again, it comes back to that building those relationships between New Zealand and Japan. Absolutely. So, yeah, lucky yeah. enough to have done some things like that. And you've met the Prime Minister here twice, right? I don't think the former Prime Minister, yep. you wouldn't have probably met her perhaps back in New Zealand, but you got to meet her twice in Japan. How was that? Uh, that was a pretty amazing experience again, right? Uh, and you had an opportunity, I know, Catherine, maybe you want to sort of share your sort of experience. <laughs> you, were, you were the MC for a another of story, events. another time. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, working with you on that trip, right, when she came for the first time and the second time, but mostly that first time when she was here. And the organization that goes into it and the background was absolutely mind blowing. Uh, I yeah. learned a lot from you with the protocols and the ways that you do things that when you're actually in the moment, people see it uh, like a, I guess, like a drama or a movie or an operetta or something. It, you, people show up on stage and you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. And yeah. that was what it was like. It was really a great opportunity for me yeah. to be involved in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. There's certainly there's months of planning, and in the last time the prime minister came um, last year, there was a, there was a sort of a big business delegation that came along as well. There was a media delegation that the trade minister came, and it's really an opportunity for us, um, you know, getting back to that a little bit that top of the pyramid and how that sort of um, strengthens all of the, you know cascades downwards. So 
we have the attention for a short time of the Japanese system because New Zealand's a small country and mm. um, you know Japan is this, is a huge country even though we, we we have good relations and that sort of thing. But you know when when our prime minister's here, it's a real chance to sort of highlight all the things that we're doing together and also to propose and put some things on the table, things we can do together to work together more closely. So that's what, what we do. We use those visits as an opportunity to say to the Japanese, well, look, our prime minister is going to be here. The media is here. We want to be able to sort of announce that we're going to be doing something together, working together. So what, what can we sort of announce? And then that is kind of an action forcing event so that afterwards we work away with the Japanese side. And well, your, your prime minister did say that you wanted to work more closely with us in renewable energy or in, mm. um, in sort of space cooperation or whatever. And so so they, um, they're they always very careful not to commit to anything they actually can't follow through on. And so right. um, mm. some of the things like be, last... It will be picked up on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like last time um, our Prime Minister was here, she announced that it, there was some new funding, $8 million for joint research between New Zealand and Japan. So we're sort of following up on that now to work out, you know, who are the different universities and, and different groups that are doing research um, between New Zealand and Japan. And where can we sort of boost those efforts and get some more things mm. going. And um, so, yeah, those are sort of examples. I think um, when the Prime Minister was here, you know, we, she was promoting that whole recovery and um, the fact that our borders were open because uh, the visit last visit happened in May 2022. And we just, around about that time we opened, and it might have been April actually, we opened the borders in May, I think about a week after, to tourists from Japan. So we we're like, New Zealand's open for business. And, you know, you yeah. get a lot of mm. media coverage. And and we announced that the the working holiday schemes were open again. Um, so working holiday schemes is another amazing tool that, that kind of brings young people to kind of enjoy and experience each other's com- countries. And I've I've been a beneficiary of that myself as well. So you know we're able to kind of restart a whole bunch of things. So yeah, so that those that sort of leader level diplomacy is a um, pretty amazing thing to be involved in. You know, I was lucky enough, for example, to be at some of the meetings or the the lunch between with the prime ministers and um yeah just seeing that at the high level those kind of interactions and finding those um shared history so for example one really nice story what some um, our former prime minister she had hosted um some japanese exchange students back in the day a long time ago probably 30 years ago maybe even a bit more because she's quite a bit younger than i am <laughs> and um <laughs> and we, we actually tracked down the the homestay the homestay students who went down to, to stay with her and, and we had a little meeting and it was um it was a nice thing that, that we sort of mm. those again those people to people connections and she mm. could sort of refer to that in her meetings uh, the ties go just go really deep they're not just sort of the leader to leader we're just meeting for the first time you know our former prime minister had studied japanese at high school a little bit like me and it had had these homestay connections and um mm. so just brings it all together yeah, it was great. I think that was such a magical thing to have done to bring the homestays back. That was really, someone really had their thinking cap on there. Um, that was a really great personal, 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 personal moment there. But um, I was thinking a little bit about insights you might have for Kiwis who are doing business in Japan um, and how they can do it successfully here because you've been here for four years. And I know being in government is different to being in business. But is there something that you've seen or observed that could be quite useful that, say, New Zealand does really well? Or perhaps you wanted to talk also about things that you've seen here that you've observed that could be quite useful for Kiwis doing business that they should really know about. So I'm a little bit, a little bit hesitant to, to sort of speak too authoritatively because um, I've been here four and a half years and I, I had another four year stint here back in the 90s. So I have had probably eight years, but I mean, I know from listening to some of your podcasts, you've had lots of people who've been here for more than 20 years and that sort of thing. And But it definitely, I think there's a certain way of doing things in Japan. And if I think about it, I've almost inhabited two different worlds. So when I was here in Japan last time, I was, well, maybe three, let's say, I was working at ski fields and rafting and that sort of thing. It's very kind of quite casual, casual language, casual Japanese, very sort of friendly, making jokes and all that sort of stuff. And then... Um, I was also worked in a high school, um, or actually I was working in elementary school. My wife was working in a, in a high school on the JET program. And uh, that's another experience, right? Because you're in a slightly more formal system. Mm. And then, then this time around, it's kind of up a level where you're having quite formal meetings. And so I was thinking about, you know, what what would be helpful to tell some business people? One of the things I really noticed this time back um, is when you get sort of to go into an important meeting, the traditional way that it's done in Japan is that the two most important people do all the talking. 
and the other people in the room don't really do any talking. They're sort of sitting around. The, they're mostly around the table. This is in the in the, the meetings that I, I'm in anyway. And you sort of wonder, is there any point in all the other people in the room? And and actually there is. <laughs> um, the aisatsu is really important, as you know. So the greetings are really important. So at the beginning of the meeting, you all exchange business cards, and everyone probably knows this about Japan. You know, you get the business cards and take a good look at them, that sort of thing. And there's sort of the a mana that rubs off on the, the other people in the room from being selected to be in that meeting. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you're sitting across from your counterpart and then you probably, you've exchanged business cards and you'll probably connect connect up later. So I've mentioned before about the, like the energy minister sitting at the table talking to the shacho and then she would introduce her team and ha- being introduced by this senior person means they've kind of got the, the nod of approval and uh, that gave them a, a kind of good in and um the other thing is sort of i guess i've learned is that japanese are very considerate and when i mentioned before the aisatsu right and you know this time of year you have a meeting in japan and people will say oh atsui naka um you know, <laughs> yeah you know, it's the sort of way you start a sentence to say thank mm. you it's even in this heat thank you mm. for coming to mm-hmm. uh, to meet with me or and if it's raining you know, oh, I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, you've gone to all yeah. this trouble to come um and it's always there's always some some reason why it was difficult to come or whatever <laughs> yeah if it's um so it's either you're busy or it's hot or whatever so those, just recognizing those sort of things is one thing mm-hmm. another one is i just went up to hokkaido recently for a bit of a farewell visit and i i knew i really wanted to say thank you to all the people up there who've been working on our kind of reconnections and relationships and whatever and sometimes arigato gozaimasu is not quite enough and um so knowing japan there's lots of different layers of formality and and you can, you can say more formal things like um ore moshi agemasu or tansha moshi agemasu um and when people hear that they feel even more special and so there's this sort of function i think through the japanese language of that that you know so using some of those special phrases and things like that so i do think it's worth trying to learn some of the the kind of the greetings and um and that sort of thing even if you you can't quite dive right into the language and if you've been like most of my meetings i do in english with foreign affairs and that sort of thing they've got great english but i do you know use these these important phrases where people put people at ease they they know that you kind of have looked into or understand the culture and i think that really it's forming those relationships and uh recognizing and respect respecting the culture i think that's sort of a bit of a point of difference for new zealand actually that we we really mm. should have recognized the culture respect the culture and um and we want to work with japan um, yeah that's a good point because the other f- informal language is not wrong it's just a context isn't it so yeah, yeah totally you know i spent a number of years in kansai area and so when i go down there and get out of a taxi i am saying my do okini or dom you know i don't use arigato gozaimasu yep. when I get out of a taxi in Osaka. Yep. It's always yeah. maido or, you know, they yep. say maido okine and I'm always like, ah, oh, okine. And you'll yep. use a dialect there, right? So I wouldn't mm. use that up in Tokyo unless I wanted to have fun. No, that's um, right. Probably, what are you talking about? And that's just completely out of context. So I love how you've also said, you know, raise yourself up to a, a more formal Japanese if required. And don't mm. just think that your domos or your <laughs> arigatos are going to get yeah, you through. Yeah. You know, be aware of that very much with the, the language. And I think also you brought out that seasonal aspect. Be very aware that Japanese are mm. very seasonally based mm. in what they say and do and how they dress and all those things. I think you've brought out really good points there. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. I mean, on the on the flip side, um, we some of our uh, diplomats here go into sort of deep formal language training before they start the job, and they've mm. very, learned very formal Japanese. But then, if they go out to a pub, they just sound completely <laughs> completely wrong. You know? so getting the register. May I please have your most honourable beer from the? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If I I'd be most you, humbly yeah. gratified if you could, yeah. if I could receive uh, your yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Are you you were thinking a little bit about um, some of the observations you had, perhaps you know the differences between working in maybe a part time job compared to other areas of Tokyo where you might work in a more formal job. Did you want to speak about those as well? I mean, I absolutely loved all my time um, kind of working at ski fields and rafting, and and I met such great people. And one of the things of observations I guess I have is there that. The Japanese education system is is quite quite tough, and mm. there's quite a bit of I guess conformity, and there's a positive side and a 
negative side to everything like this, right? You know, the positive side during COVID, there was no lockdowns in Japan and people follow the rules. People wore masks and uh, there was no mask protests. Yeah. And uh, yeah. when people were asked to stay home, they stayed at home and mm-hmm. kept people safe. And it's it's a really um it's a really great society. I've I've got a we call it Mama Chatty, the the uh, shop lady sort of shopping bike with a, a battery on it. So it's an electric bike that I can ride down to the store and I just immobilize a, I kind of just, you know, you basically tie up the wheel, but you don't really lock it to anything. And you can just, you come back an hour later or a day later and it's still there. You know, it's a very safe place. My daughters can walk around in, in the evening and it's, it's very safe. So there's all those sort of good sides of things, but there's also that conformity can be quite tough on individuals who buck, you know, buck the system, I guess. And so we met some of the most interesting people up in the world of rafting and, and mm-hmm. ski fields or whatever, who didn't want to be the nine to five salary men and, and wanted to work in nature and that sort of thing. So, you know, we, there's just really different kind of parts to society here. And um, the people who, who get through say Tokyo university and then go into government, they're incredibly hardworking, incredibly talented people. And then we have our, our kind of more, the colourful characters who who also make up Japan as well. So I've been fortunate enough to sort of meet lots of different people in Japan and um, see all those different sides to Japan. And one of the clear gaps or differences is between the, the city and the rural. And in the rural areas, as you probably know, the population's falling by half a million people a year. So in the rural areas, there's a lot of older folk and there's a lot of opportunities but there, there's there's not as many young people and then in the cities there's there's a lot going on but it's really quite contrasting sides of japan so mm. so um, those have been some of the observations and things i've seen while i've been here mm. yes as someone who does not live in tokyo i agree with you there we often hear about tokyo which is not all of japan it's only a very small slice of japan Mm. But what are some of the gold mines and opportunities for New Zealanders that you, with your potentially insider's knowledge, might be able to uncover for us? No need to release any state secrets here, but what have you seen from your position, you know, person who gets to go and meet the emperor occasionally? Sure. So one of the cool things that, that I've really seen is this kind of complementarity between New Zealand and Japan. So. One, one good example is, you know, and it's pretty obvious, right, is that we have opposite seasons. So what I've seen, for example, is, so if we hit our apple season, it's the opposite to Japanese apple season. So we we can bring our apples up in, in the kind of the gap when the, there are not really many Japanese apples on the table. So we don't need to be a sort of a threat to each other, but we can be complement each other. Mm. So we've seen quite a few people take advantage of this. So um, there are some Japanese entrepreneurs who've gone down to New Zealand to plant table grapes. Um, or plant wine mm. and, and that sort of thing. And then they can sort of ship that up to Japan and get the Japan market mm. sort of um, supplied when uh, in, the, in the off season. We had an example probably a year or so ago where um, there was a high-end Japanese restaurant here who wanted to get truffles in the off season. They usually get them from Europe. And then um, they were like, oh, I think we need to, they need to get it in the winter. Well, sort of, it's a winter sort of crop as, uh, from from memory. <laughs> and um, so then I found out that actually somewhere down near Christchurch, there's some tr- truffle farms and you can actually mm. kind of fill the gap when the Europeans were not producing truffles to kind of bring up some New Zealand truffles. Mm. Um, so that's one sort of thing that I think uh, we're definitely looking at and trying to make some connections mm. and that sort of thing. Awesome. Um, but more more broadly, the sort of sectors that we see opportunities for New Zealand businesses up here and uh, food and beverage that's sort of, probably about half of our exports up here, food and beverage and, you know, technology. There's some great innovative New Zealand companies doing really cool things in tech. Um, renewable energy, I think, is the other uh, one that we really focus on quite a lot because New Zealand has something like 85% renewable electricity. Mm. And um, Japan is like the opposite. They have like kind of about 80% fossil fuels and only 20% renewable uh, electricity. And so they're quite interested in our story, what we are doing and how we're taking advantage of, um, that and so we are trying to bring together some of the renewable energy companies that uh, can kind of some Japanese investment down to New Zealand and and some New Zealand know how up to, up here. Mm. But I guess one of the things I just wanted to kind of I guess question is this idea of the gold mine, right? The gold mine sometimes seems like let's get rich quick. I think one of the key things about the Japanese market is that you really have to be committed for the long haul. Mm. Um, it's not so much a get rich quick market. It's a sort of building those long-term relationships and 
you, you do those formal meetings we talked about before, but then you you build the relationships afterwards through a lunch or a dinner or an ijikai, a sort of uh, have a drink afterwards. And that's when you can actually get into that, maybe the, the slightly challenging questions you weren't going to ask in the formal meeting. They're kind of building relationships over a longer period of time where we're seeing people being really successful up here. Yeah, it's almost like walking into this cave where you don't know if there's gold or not. And you you hammer away at the sides there's nothing right that's like the endeavors you need to keep going with yeah. the japanese and build your relationship you keep going and there might yeah. be a little splinter of light somewhere and it's no actually it was it was a fragment of something else right so you keep going and then you do find some gold perhaps but you still don't that's still not the way to build a relationship you just got to keep going and keep hacking through uh, and some people talked about banging their heads on uh, a wall before they actually pushed through the wall and then they found that they had made their way through so it's sort of in that way isn't it you're it is definitely long term it's mm. not a short term thing and it does take time to find the gold yeah yeah no that's yeah. right i mean i've talked to senior japanese business people about you know the 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 sorgosha the trading companies some of their their strategies are very long term and they, they mm -hmm. think, let's say, for example, something everybody needs is packaging or, you know, cardboard boxes. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're going to start making cardboard boxes, um, but they're going to be there for the long haul because they're going to think, how do we improve our making of cardboard boxes over mm -hmm. years and decades? And how do we deepen relationships with the forestry companies that supply us with the ingredients? And and how do we, um, you know, make those into better products? And so they, we've got some great examples of Japanese companies that have been down in New Zealand for decades really embedded in the local community, creating jobs. And, um, you know, one example might be, let's see, Nisui has um, purchased or bought into like a joint venture with Sea Lord. And mm -hmm. um, not only do they do business together, but they provide scholarships for people from New Zealand to come up and work in the company up here. And those people become, you know, long-term kind of advocates mm -hmm. and kind of supporters for that relationship. So it's, it's really that long-term relationship. You can see, you know, Fonterra and Meiji um, or, uh, or OG Holdings down in New Zealand, um, you know, would one um, Sumitomo Forestry, you know, Nelson Not a Pines, name that and, many people in New Zealand would know, but it's a massive company doing loads of things, right? Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They might know Nelson Pines, for example. Yeah, they would. Yeah. 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 Mm. Thank you to Japan for their investment in New Zealand. That's for sure. It's really brought so many opportunities. Dom, how many... Kiwis are there in Japan? How many are registered? Yeah, good and, question. Someone asked yeah. me that, like, and I didn't know the answer. Sometimes I'm asked this. A, yeah. Well, actually, I'm asked it a lot. Yeah, how many right. Kiwis are here? And I usually give the story of, I don't know, I usually say something like 200,000, and but some aren't registered and some are, and I have really not the idea. Can you give me the facts, please? <laughs> okay. Well, I can give you the official figures. So yes. Official figures, according to... Ministry of Justice. Yeah, this is people who are basically registered who have visas to be in Japan. Um, it's about three and a half thousand. Oh. Um, so the two hundred thousand is probably more like maybe like the American community here. Um, we're not we're not that big. At any one time, we, we, might, we might have we might, you know if you counted all the people on short term stays, uh, tourists and all that sort of thing, could be four or five thousand, maybe five thousand. It seems pretty stable actually. Like a lot of those people are like yourself, sort of embedded in the community longer term. And even during COVID, we saw the numbers went down a little bit, but not, you know, some of the working visa people went home, but but it's sort of back up to near near where it was again. That's the kind of the, the official numbers. Interesting. I was thinking. That's how many jandals in Japan. How many jandals there are? <laughs> yeah. How many episodes like can you do? Oh, we've got quite a few episodes but... to go there, Jane. Yeah. But um, Sing out well, it sounds like listening. everyone's listening, though, from the looks of those numbers. Just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> so what does the embassy do for Kiwis? I mean, I know how you help me on a certain different other levels, but what is the openness, the outwardness from embassy to Kiwis who are living in Japan? Yeah, sure. Well, we love to keep in touch with uh, Kiwis in Japan. And um, one of the things I really want to use this opportunity to give a bit of a shout out to on today is uh something called Safe Travel. And uh, yeah. safe, safe Travel is, is a service provided by New Zealand government and you can register yourself. And if you're registered on Safe Travel, then, um, you know, if there's a disaster or whatever, then and we will, as the embassy, you know, try to help find Kiwis and connect them with their family and use whanau in New Zealand, that sort of thing. Let's say all the communications are down and, you know, these, mm. these things have happened, as you, as you well know, Jane, 
Yeah, um, I was the recipient of support in 2011 from the embassy when that happened here in Fukushima. So yeah. let me just say thank you for that, even though it was somebody else was on the phone. But yeah, it's yeah. an amazing service that the embassy does for Kiwis in times of need. Yes, very. Yeah, so good. so we want to be really well prepared. And, and um, let me throw a question back to you two. Um, if you were to guess out of the three and a half, four, four possibly pushing 5,000 people in Japan at any one time, how many do you think are registered on safe travel? Not many. Not many. Many, but have a guess. Uh, 1, less than 100? Oh, so somewhere in between your two guesses. So <laughs> around, about, around about 300, less than 300. 300. No way. That... Yeah, less, than, less than 10%. So most, I guess Kiwis are kind of a little bit maybe okay. less happy. Right, we're putting oh, that sure. in the show notes. We are yeah. definitely yeah. shouting right. out travel. about this yeah, one. Yeah. Get yeah, registered. Yeah. All right. Yeah, get, oh, seriously? Get registered. Yeah, yeah. 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 Woo. Okay. So um, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's one of my first messages. Get get registered. Mm. Mm. It's not. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we definitely would try to you know provide information, look after you know look after people. If people get in trouble, um, we, we we can be there to help. Um, there's obviously limits to what we what we can do. Um, uh, don't but, do stupid stuff, basically, and expect yeah, the embassy to come and help you. Can't, maybe <laughs> yes. not. Yeah, but even, if even you people... are in trouble because of. Yeah, something that's even, happened. Even to people you. who do stupid stuff, we, we do. You do that. try? No. <laughs> yeah, yes, we we, no. we kind. We, we're there. We're, we're, we're there for New Zealand you. citizens um, who who need help. It's a bit of a sort of a help you to help yourself type model. Yes, um, right. So yep. let's say if you if you are unfortunate enough to get arrested in Japan, we can we can provide assistance in explaining the process and the system and and you know put you in touch with a lawyer and that sort of thing. But we're not going to be able to bail you out of jail or stop the Japanese government from pressing charges and it's sort of sure. thing, right? So so the other things, some of the other things New Zealand embassy does, we provide um some documentation like doc certifying document services mm. and that sort of thing. So there's a, some things if you need to call onto the embassy and get your documents stamped for some official purposes, uh, we can we can help out with that. Um and of course we we just we like to hear from people every year, for example, um we get the annual jet program people from New Zealand come in and um we this year there's nearly a hundred new jets going out to various provinces all around Japan. So we bring them in and give them a bit of a pep talk. Um, you know, what are you going to expect out there? <laughs> and um, and don't forget you're going to be ambassadors for your um, for your country. Mm -hmm. People are. Uh, when I was teaching in um, in Gunma, um, I went around about ten or twelve different schools, and there was probably a thousand kids at each school. Most of them, it was the first time they'd ever met a foreigner. So like for those twelve thousand kids, their impression of foreigners and New Zealanders was was me this <laughs> big pink and orange foreigner yeah <laughs> and so um so and we also give them a few tips on you know how to kind of how to succeed in japan and that sort of thing so we, we always love to hear from you know kiwis in japan and um make some of those connections so remember i was talking about the the pyramid before there are these important other organizations like the um, australia new zealand chamber of commerce the japan new zealand um, business council we we as an embassy we support those organizations that also support the pyramid yeah. so we try to sort of support the new zealand community key where we can um and, and support the efforts of the new zealand communities which is a great community in japan mm. yeah i have to say and i have been i have lived in quite a few countries in my time the tokyo embassy outdoes itself for what what you guys do thank you so much for always being there for new zealanders and you've got an event coming up soon where all New Zealanders can come into the embassy if you're registered for it. Yes, that's it's right. So one soon. of the, so yeah. I think I heard you mention this on the podcast in a recent episode. Actually, we have a new national holiday of Matariki, and uh, so we're taking the opportunity to invite uh, New Zealanders in Japan to come in to the embassy and celebrate our new national holiday together. So and it's quite an opportunity. We we try at least once a year, either in Waitangi Day or or this. We're taking the opportunity this year in the new holiday of Matariki to bring together the New Zealand community and celebrate this amazing new national holiday. So if you haven't registered already, um, it's happening this this weekend. So Yeah, that might be a bit late for this one, but next year, right? Keep it in mind for next year. Exactly. Potentially, it's going to be something that happens in the future. Yeah. And what's next for you, Dom, after so you I'm leave us? Yeah. Heading back to Windy Wellington, my uh, my now home hometown. Looking forward to catching up with friends and family. And then I'll be landing a job somewhere in my head office, um, probably working on a new part of, uh, or a different part of the world. Uh, so this is one of the cool things about my current job is we we get to go offshore, have a bit of an adventure, come back home, reconnect, 
um, you know, with New Zealand, because New Zealand changes quite a bit in four years while you're away. It's a little bit mm. like that Rip Van Winkle effect where you come back and you're the oh. person who's just been asleep for 100 years. Oh, My latte <laughs> now quite. costs $10 or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. It's kind of close, yeah. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then yeah. you, because we're representing New Zealand offshore, we have to sort of reconnect with our... You do, our, yeah. New Zealand, you know, pretty, re pretty regularly. And um, so I'm really looking forward to going back, catching up with family, taking us some... Live rugby games in the mm. cake tin. In the cake tin, yes. Yeah, yeah. And you um, might catch a bit of the FIFA too while you're there. Yes, yeah. New Zealand's hosting the uh, Women's Football World Cup, which is a huge event. So we're pretty proud. Of, like New Zealand last year did a great job hosting the Women's Rugby World Cup. Um, and what an amazing result. Yeah. Um, yeah, it really puts exactly. New Zealand on the map, you know, when we're doing these right. these kind of mm. things. Um, so and with we, FIFA, it's Australia and New Zealand isn't co-hosting, but a lot of the games are being held, I think, in four centres in, in New Zealand. So it's going to be mm. awesome. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be hosting a FIFA kind of related event here at the embassy um, just to sort of draw attention to the fact that we're hosting this big major tournament. Yeah. And um, actually there's um, uh, one of the members of the Japanese royal family is going down to New Zealand to su mm. support the... Uh, Japanese team. Mm. Yes. Very yeah, yeah, good. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we'll um, you know, I forgot to mention actually our through our social media channels on the embassy. Um yeah. We have a Facebook page and Instagram page and we, we put out news about New Zealand there and you know, things like this that are happening. Um we've got probably twenty five thousand followers, a lot of um Japanese people are interested in New Zealand and we try to kind of keep them informed about what's happening between our two countries. So this is a big one we'll definitely promote on social media. We also loved your one minute profiles that you did of a lot of New Zealanders in Japan and uh, Japanese in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It was wonderful. It was a really great series that you did there. We're probably it's probably the short the short snippet version of what what you're doing here with the in depth interviews. So, uh, so <laughs> shout out to Thomas from the, the yeah Thomas yes, Thomas well uh, done yeah so that was great actually um, during COVID we again couldn't meet in person as much so we were thinking what can we do a bit more online that we could mm. you know share the stories and that sort of thing so we had a bit more time to do that kind of thing it's really great yeah and anything at the end here any questions for us or requests as you leave that you'd like to leave us with well maybe it's too big a question to ask right at the <laughs> right at the end but i was saying um you know the complementarity and complementary things that we can um do between new zealand and japan and you know i think you might have mentioned it in a recent podcast actually was that they had a um a sort of a world survey of gender equality and new zealand came out to I think number four in the list and japan was quite a lot further down the list and i know japan's really making trying to make efforts in this in this regard and um as an embassy we're often thinking about how can we sort of share some of our experiences and um you know with with japan and in a respectful sort of way to say um i guess here's here's diff some different ways of doing things and here's a uh, some suggestions or as women entrepreneurs in japan what what are you, any observations in this whole big field of you know how to improve gender equality and gender empowerment in japan and and what we can do is a kiwi community and and even at the at, through the embassy and things yeah, I think you're right. Japan has slipped from 116 to 125. So down nine points on the World Economic Forum's Gender Diversity Index, which is a shame. But Japan is trying in various places, right? And we, I think both Jane and I are really very, very keen to see an uplifting and an expansion of Japanese women in their own businesses and also throughout corporate Japan. There are so many advantages that uh, we feel that perhaps males get through the community that women do not have even access to. And we'd really love to see more of that. And I think as New Zealand women, Wahine Toa are doing their best here, that we need more of our New Zealand women who are in Japan here to also be showing up and helping. Uh, we like to carry the flag, but we also think it's, it's, it's easier to carry quite a heavy flag if we've got more of us doing that. We'd love to see some more of our wonderful New Zealand women brought up here, perhaps. Um, and not all of them have to be under the government's budget. Businesses would love to hear from some of the successful New Zealand women who are doing business who've just gone about it. They've got probably a million hints for Japanese women, how they can start their business or how they can export right, how they can get, there's so many wonderful things in Japan that can be exported that women could do. So we'd love to see some of that, perhaps sponsored by some of the wonderful companies you talked about, and perhaps 
that would be a great way to show some more of how New Zealand does it on the stage, the world stage, and help Japan do it from a real grassroots level. Jane, what about you? Yeah, um, I've been having these conversations with Japanese women recently. And first of all, many of them were not aware there was a problem, which is a problem in itself. I feel they were sort of saying, but I have a good life. I'm happy. I, I have a comfortable life. Maybe I don't want to go and waste my time in politics because we know what's happening over there. I'm, I'm putting my values in the forefront of my life, which is values that don't necessarily match up with New Zealand individualistic kind of thinking values. Mm -hmm. um, they're wanting their family to be the most important thing. Um, so what does it matter about my career? as much as that my family is well fed and, and happy and all of these things. So I was yeah interested to talk to a different, maybe a different sort of strata of women in Japan who are kind of happy. They were not 100% happy, right? They were like, well, husbands first, maybe we could get rid of husbands first, you know, <laughs> but my children, so important. I want to put them first. And so maybe I'm going to go about my career a different way and having and some outsiders come and tell me that I'm not doing enough it was not really well taken, actually. So that was an interesting uh, conversation to have um, and notice that, oh, I'm bringing my kind of Western individualistic mm. thinking to this conversation where you guys are talking about different things. We're kind of not really on the mm. same wavelength here. But then I was sort of thinking, well, New Zealand, Japan, which women are happier or, you know, who's, who's got the best life. You can't really compare those either. So I was, sort of came away with more questions than answers really. But what did strike me was that they hadn't seen it. So they didn't know what they should be wanting. That was something that they were like, well, so what, what is this? What does this look like? They hadn't seen enough examples of women that they might want to emulate. So I think that is what New Zealand women can do. It's not necessarily telling Japanese women what they should be doing better or no, you shouldn't be making bentos at five o'clock in the morning, which is what happens in Japan. It's just showing up and being you and doing what you do and being an example of how you could potentially live your life and do your career. Um, I certainly try to do that here in Fukushima. And often I have Japanese women say, how are you doing this? So they will, they will come to me and ask me, how are you going away on business trips? I can't leave my family alone, this kind of thing. But when we're talking about making women into these managers and lifting them up, I'm like, yeah, but we've got to take off the brakes that are yeah. on the women down here in the, in the system, which is what I experience every day in my life here in Japan as a mother and a working mother of two children who go to Japanese elementary school. So yeah, how can we improve the system that put the brakes on women from having the bandwidth to be able to shoot up into these managerial positions and board positions yeah. that Japanese businesses supposedly are creating for them. Um, mm -hmm. But do they actually want that as well? That and that's their, why Japan's slipping, success. isn't it? That's why it's slipped because we haven't created the systems yet mm. and still hasn't changed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we've left you with a big one there. Yeah, well, that's a, no, those are, those are uh, really great points, actually. I think, um, you know, what I take out of that is it's having these conversations is really important and, and, yeah. and from a respectful way, you're not thinking we've got it all right and uh, yeah. and you haven't. And then, but also choices is really important, right? It's, it needs to be that that the choice to focus on family is a totally valid choice, but also if you wanted to, to focus on career, you need to be able to have that choice as well. Yeah. That's probably where I see that there could be some gains here. And um, yeah, just picking up some of your suggestions, we, um, we our FIFA networking event is a, is a women's networking event that we're having uh, next week I oh, know two weeks time um, so we're leveraging off the back New Zealand's hosting the um, the Women's Football World Cup to have a, a networking event which will hopefully sort of help to bring people together and have some of these conversations and mm. maybe we need a new series yeah, I Catherine. think we need a new series. Well, we need a series. We need something like that to be not one and done, but to continue. So my challenge I would put down is to, you know, how can we have those continue or break off into groups that can continue that conversation, that especially as, as Jane was talking there about breaking some of the systems. How can we help to mm. do that, you know? Yeah. In practical um, ways. like you're In practical ways. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, Dom, 
congratulations on being a very successful jandal in Japan. You've earned it now and for telling us all today about your wonderful story uh, of coming into Japan and your success here uh, as a person. Thank you. And also as a diplomat. And we look forward to you being a successful jandal back in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as well as you take your next steps. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks very much. Thanks for your time. It's great to chat today. I just loved hearing from Dom. We are so lucky to have him as part of our jandal community in the embassy. I'm going to miss you, Dom. Yeah, you've Aww. been such a great strength. And look at what you've brought to the relationship right at that level well that top level you talked about the pyramid the top but also all the way filtering through you've been there and been really supportive of everybody that Mm. you've made contact with it's quite clear yeah Yeah. on the ground rafting making (laughs) friends in otaru catching up with the emperor like that's yeah you know as you do better person to have doing all these things for New Zealand. Thank you for telling those stories because they matter. And it's, I love that some Kiwis would say, oh, that's bragging or whatever. It's not bragging to me. It's like blow your really healthy trumpet. These Hmm. are really great stories of how things come full circle and what you're doing, you're meant to do Hmm. in that moment. And then there's some significance for it later. And look what happened. Hmm. I mean, the whole story that Dom told us was just full of interwoven pieces that all came together and where Mm. he is now so he's leaving in a a really i think comfortable kind of satisfied Mm. and happy moment to be Mm -hmm. departing and going back to new zealand and and reconnecting there yeah i hope we see you back in japan in the future at some point in some way we do want you back at some point let's see what happens but Lots of things that he did, even through those COVID times, you know, that APEC online, the virtual trade delegations, and then reopening when the energy minister came and you and I mm. were at a couple of those events. And it was great to see that like real energy yeah. um, in those meetings that we saw too. And I also really loved how Dom talked about those sort of different levels of communicating in Japanese that you might use if you're mm. rafting and having fun with your mates, right? Or in your, the teacher job, your jet program yeah. job and then the, the Japanese that he uses now and that none of them are wrong. It's just different things for different types of moments that we're in. Mm. So that was really essential to hear. Yeah, it can be hard to sort of understand the difference in the deepness of meaning of between mm. saying domo and then saying mm. something far more formal, formal yeah. right? And but you get used to it when you're in those situations, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, this t- this situation calls for a moshiwake gozaimasen, you know, instead of just a agomenne, you know. Like. <laughs> yeah, there's different times for that. Yeah. And also just his bringing out of obviously for the way that New Zealand and Japan are so complementary. That came out mm. a lot that word uh, and for New Zealanders yeah. thinking about Japan, just always be thinking long term, you know, gold mine that we often use, but he put it in context, right, that it is a long term project It's not something just flash in the pan, commit to it, right, and mm. have it as a long term thing. And there are lots mm. of things that we can do using the seasons. And that's come up a couple of times, but certainly it's a really great way to think. Mm. And also, finally, you know, that safe travel we mentioned, oh, yes, that was just travel. shocking. You Kiwis I'm get so out shocked. there and get registered on that. I'm on that. Like, I'm on that. You know, well, that means that's, that's at least 200 and, and my whole family's registered. Of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a little right. bit shocked because honestly, and I, I'm just going to get a little bit, you know, ranty here, is that this could really help you if something happens in Japan again in the natural disaster. Because, and I'll tell you, when uh, Fukushima meltdown happened I had the embassy on the phone with me saying how are you where are you can we get you out what can we do until they knew that I was safe they kept contacting me and kept in touch with me and in the end they weren't able to do much but to me it was such a relief to know that my government from New Zealand was trying to do their best to help me so Absolutely. please 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 get yourself on there you know in Japan, you really just do not know what's coming next, right? Like mm. massive typhoon or Nankai Torof or whatever, you know, this thing they're predicting. 
I remember they did reach out then too and they issued us with iodine tablets and I don't know that we needed them or maybe we did you know we didn't know what was going to happen at that time mm -hmm. but we were issued with uh, certain warnings and guidance and those particular tablets yes, yes, got sent yes. to our, mm. our post box so you know it was really important to be connected in that way and not just think oh I'm it's fine that you can actually get real she'll help. be right yeah you can she'll be help. right mate and doesn't work help. that's right and they yeah can. 3,500 to 5,000 New Zealanders in Japan. That was a surprise. Surely yeah. there's there's more of us. But I know that there's a lot more back home who have been here, who mm. kind of mm. maybe they wish they were here or they want to come back, whatever. So the community that has a connection with Japan is, is much, much greater, I'm sure. Than... It is indeed. Mm. Well, Let's thank get you, all Dom. of them listening to Jandals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you very, very much. If you think there's someone you know who would be great to come on the podcast, let us know. Mm. We are always looking. Um, and we have lots of people recommended to us, but also we find little Kiwis hiding under rocks as well. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We've had some amazing introductions, so you just never know. You know, If you know someone who would be a great guest, yeah, reach out to us, Japan at gmail.com. And we'll see you on the next episode. I think that's after the summer break. We'll yeah, catch see you, after you summer. on the flip side. Okay. Bye. Bye. for listening make sure you check out our guests links in the show notes this podcast is brought to you today by Catherine o'connell law and pod launch with jane if you have a great story you think should be on the show come and find us on linkedin or instagram we'd love to hear from you see you next time mata ne